At long last, I finally created a review video for the much loved Universal Audio Apollo Twin X Duo. I'm going to try to do my best to cram in a lot here, so bear with me and stay tuned for all the nerdy stuff that's coming right up. So, good day and welcome to the Time Preservation Society. I'm Gandalf the Grey. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell notification so you can be notified of new content right when it drops. Cheers. I don't know. The Apollo Twin is a well-known audio interface. If you watch audio-based YouTube videos, you've seen it many, many times. In fact, it's almost as if all the pros and audio heroes use Apollos. It's so prevalent that you might subconsciously want to get one without even knowing why. It's like product placement on steroids. Is it the look of it? Is it that big dial? Is it the super cool UA logo? Is it the sound quality? Why spend more than $1,000 on an audio interface? Well, it's so much more. It's virtual analog heaven. I'll apologize now for the length of this video. There's a lot to cover, and even at 25 minutes, if I make it under 25 minutes, there would still be probably hours to go if I really did a deep dive. So in the interest of saving time and also delivering to you a large amount of information, I'm going to keep the humor and distractions to a minimum. Please feel free to skip to the chapter that most interests you. It's a long one. Okay, maximum effort. So I'm currently filming this with the Sennheiser 416, which is just up here. And I've got it going into the Apollo uh, using the uh, Avalon preamp, more on that later, and also into Luna, more on that as well later. And that's, what's, that's what I'm doing right now. So let's begin with a quick history, because I always do that. Universal Audio began in 1958, which was A Night to Remember and the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad Ago. It was launched by Bill Putnam Sr., he was an innovative recording engineer who was a favorite for many artists like uh, Frank Sinatra or Ray Charles, Nat King Cole, to name a few lesser known artists. He invented the first modern recording console, the very first multiband EQ, and the first vocal booth. And he was the first to use artificial reverberation in recordings. He, along with his friend Les Paul, uh, were the first to develop and use stereoscopic recording. I mean, he's kind of a big deal. Some of his most famous creations are still used today as highly sought after and modeled gear, like the 610 preamp or the LA-2A compressor uh, or the 1176 compressor. Fast forward to 1999, which was Sleepy Hollow and The Mummy Ago, when his son Bill Putnam Jr. refounded Universal Audio and took it to the future. I'd say he did a pretty fantastic job of it. In 2012, the Apollo interface was launched. The concept was brilliant, employed the best engineers in the world to recreate high-end digital emulations of analog gear, and have those emulations operate fully inside the Apollo unit itself using its own shark processor chips and remove stress from your own computer's processing. The result is near zero latency, real-time tracking through the very best digital recreations of analog gear on Earth. And I do mean the best. Wanna fight about it? Everyone knows that UAD, Universal Audio Digital, have the very best analog emulating plugins even if some people don't want to admit it. <laughs> They're unbeatable. They are also insanely expensive, so there's that. There have been many generations and versions of the Apollo units over the last decade. From desktop interfaces to complex rack units, the Apollo line has found its way into many pro recording studios around the world. The much-loved Apollo Twin went through some versions, of course, the latest being the Twin X series, which have the advantage of having superior AD converters, at, uh, analog digital. The same ones found in the X series rack units. Here's some quick specs. The Apollo Twin X Duo has two phantom-powered mic inputs and a third high-impedance quarter-inch instrument input that cancels out and replaces channel 1 XLR input when you plug it in. Duo means it's got two DSP chips, that's two digital si signal processing 
chips, like CPU chips in computers. It records up to 24 bits at 192 kilohertz. It has a maximum dynamic range of 65 decibels when it's on its own, when it's on its own preamp without using emulations. More on that later. Expandable with up to eight additional inputs using the Toslink optical ADAT. So you can essentially add eight additional channels to it so that you have a total of 10 simultaneous recordings. The uh, headphone output has a dynamic range of 124 dBA. Uh, it's also able to take on the characteristics of several classic and coveted preamps, consoles, and channel strips through the UAD's proprietary Unison technology. That's actually the point of an Apollo. Okay, let's have a closer look at it. I'm sure by now you've seen these sleek looking interfaces before. It's a beautiful piece of equipment. It's an all metal design that feels very expensive. And that's because it is. The twin is a desktop device that has a slight slant to its design so it's easier to read from your chair. It features a giant volume knob in the middle of its face, which is flanked by a digital LED input VU meter on the left and a digital LED output VU meter on the right. Under each meter is a selector button which toggles between a few functions. The preamp button on the left switches the operating mode of both the volume dial and the six buttons along the bottom. When you push the preamp button, it switches to preamp mode for your first input and the dial becomes an input gain knob. If you press it again, it changes to the second preamp and the dial becomes a gain for the second channel. When in preamp mode, the six buttons on the bottom control the input, toggling from mic to line level ins, a high pass filter so that you can roll off the lows between 75 hertz, a 48 volt phantom power on and off switch, a minus 20 decibel pad button to instantly lower your gain if your source is too loud. It also has a polarity switch to correct phasing on the way in and a link button to link both preamps together into one stereo channel, which would come in handy if you use the Sphere, the Townsend, used to be called Townsend, now called the DLX mic Sphere. Going to be reviewing that very soon. On the right, under the output VU meter, is the monitor button, which selects the output mode. Pressing it once controls your monitor output for, say, a pair of near-field speakers, and pressing it a second time switches to headphone output control. In both modes, the dial becomes the volume control and then the buttons change to different functions. A talkback button, so you can communicate with your talent through the headphones. A dim button, which instantly drops the listening volume for when you need to suddenly listen to a quieter signal. Then the alt button, which switches to a second set of monitors that you can configure in the console. And then the function button, which can be assigned to control monitoring functions when you have a couple of Apollo units combined. You can do that too. A mono button which will instantly convert your sound from stereo to mono, excellent for mixing, and a mute button for when you might want to cut all sound instantly. The very front side of the Apollo has your high impedance input for guitar or bass which automatically switches to instrument ins as soon as you plug it in, and a single headphones output on the other side. The back side of the unit, moving right to left, has channel 1 and channel 2 XLR inputs. It's important to note that if you plug a guitar or bass into the front high impedance input, it cancels the channel 1 XLR input. So you're not actually getting a third input for three simultaneous channel recordings, unfortunately. But I did have to tell you that. Then you have your balanced quarter inch TRS monitor outputs. This is where you would go out to your speaker monitors. Then you have outputs three and four, which can be used for a second pair of monitors or to feed a headphone amp. Either way, it's a second output with its own set of controls in the software. Next, you have a Thunderbolt 3 connection. Please note that a Thunderbolt 3 cable is needed and cannot be substituted with a USB-C cable. A lot of people make that mistake. I know it looks like it would work, but trust me, it won't. You need to be sure you have or purchase a Thunderbolt 3 cable. And I mean that literally because Apollo does not come with a Thunderbolt cable. I know, that's strange and kind of a piss off. But luckily, most audio or music shops will throw a cable in for you if you ask. So make sure you ask. Next is your power connection. The adapter not only plugs in, but you twist it to lock it in place. Also, you need to know that 
If you just plug it in without twisting it, sometimes it, it won't even turn on. You'll think you got a faulty unit. You gotta twist it to lock it. Next is your optical end. This is how you can expand your input channels to your Apollo. As I said before, you can use a third-party preamp rack with optical ADAT Toslink outs and plug them in here. A lot of people use the Focusrite Scarlet or Claret Octoprise, or even the Behringer ADA200, and it can bring the Apollo Twin from two simultaneous inputs to 10. And finally, the on and off switch. Oh, and it also has a Kensington security slot in case you're looking at securing it for some reason. It weighs 2.4 pounds. It's not light, but you're not going to be holding it while you use it, I hope. It measures, oh, hold on a second. Let me just find my trusty old measuring tape here. You know, this measuring tape was manufactured in France in 2002. I picked it up at an island prison called Chateau Deef in 1829. Anyway. It's 6.3 inches wide by 6.2 inches long and 2.6 inches tall. So how does it sound? Well, this is a tricky question because it does what no other interface can do that I'm aware of, and that is emulate several famous preamps inside the device itself using its unison technology. The Apollo will actually physically change impedance and the gain structures change as the preamp models are switched out. You can sometimes hear the Apollo physically click. I mean from the device, not through the speakers or headphones or anything. It sounds like this. Okay, now let's look at the insides through the software. For this section, we're going to go into the software, which UAD calls console. I'll switch through the different preamps and then max the gain out so you can hear what each one is doing when you fully saturate the signal so you can get a, a kind of an idea of, of what it would do if you were to go overboard and max it out. Not like you ever would, but you could. And you'll hear the sound. Anyway, it's strongly advised to put on some headphones for this next part so you can hear the intricacies of the different preamps. If you're new to audio, you may not hear the subtle differences in the various preamps, but if your ears are trained, you definitely will. Okay, let's go inside the Apollo. Okay, so here I am inside the uh, console by Universal Audio, which I really, really like. Uh, now, I've, I've made it big for the screen here and, and left a big space where I can throw the preamps, but here I am on the uh, 416, but I'm much closer now. I'm more doing a voiceover type of thing. You're listening to the preamp of the Apollo Twin X without a unison uh, preamp added in. So this is just the basic what it comes with and uh, this is the sound so let's go ahead and look at some unison plugins so first let's let's go through them all okay so uh, let's try with API vision first okay so this is the sound of the API and this is the API vision console uh, it's got quite a bit of stuff here and I'm just gonna try to not pay attention to anything else uh, and just use uh, just the preamps here. Um, so it's got a compressor, it's got gate, it's got all that stuff. So now let's crank it. And now we're hearing the preamp uh, with the mic input cranked all the way up and you can hear the saturation happening with the API. That's the sound. Moving on to the next preamp. Okay, so now you're hearing the sound of the Avalon. Uh, this is a much loved uh, preamp by a lot of people uh, used for voiceover and used for all kinds of singing and music and all kinds of stuff so this is the sound of the Avalon okay so we're totally maxing out the preamp now uh, the input here I've got the preamp gain on and I've actually increased the gain here with the gain button uh, so this is a sound of it maxed out so it's very subtle but you can definitely hear that saturation all right moving on to the next one Okay, so now you're hearing the sound of the Century Tube preamp. Uh, a lot of people like this as well. It's a sleeper, uh, according to a lot of uh, musician friends that I know. Uh, so this is the sound. All right, so let's max it out. Okay, so we should be totally maxed out here. Um, and this is what it sounds like with the preamp totally maxed out. You can see the over overload light clicking on and off okay so that's the sound of this preamp let's move on okay so now you're hearing the sound of the helios type 69 preamp um 
A lot of people like this preamp. It's very, very musical. It's got a lot of saturation. You can already hear it. You can hear that uh, 69 sound uh, coming out of it. So this is that. So let's max it out. Okay, so now we're totally maxed out, so you can, you can hear that saturation a lot. Um, so that's the sound. All right, moving on. Okay, so now you're hearing the sound of the Manly Vox Box. Once again, another very much loved uh, preamp. This actually is among the, the most favorite that uh, UAD does in preamps. This is based on a Manly Vox Box uh, tube uh, preamp. It's got all kinds of great stuff in here um, that you can use all in one channel strip, including compressors, and you've got a de-esser in here, EQ, um, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, oop, the compressor was on. Let's turn that off. So this is a sound of the Manly Vox Box. All right, let's max it out. Okay, so now we're totally maxed out on the Manly Vox Box. Ooh, it's got that tube saturation you can really hear. So that's the Manly Vox Box maxed out so you can hear what it does and how it differs. Moving on to the next preamp. This is a sound of the Neve 88RS. We've got no EQs engaged. We've got no compressors, but it's got all kinds of stuff here that you can use. And uh, this is, once again, a sleeper for a lot of people. They look at it and they think, well, it's kind of like a weaker Neve 1084 or 10, 1073, but um, it's, very, it's what you'd use to record an orchestra. Uh, or voiceover or any of that stuff, which which is what I'm doing right now. I'm doing voiceover. That's what this sounds like. So let's crank it up and we'll hear the saturation. Okay, so now we're saturating, as you can see. We're overloading, and this is the sound of full saturation of the Neve 88RS. So this is the very well-loved Neve 1084, and you can hear that. I mean, I can. I can hear the sound of that amazing preamp this is world famous the neve preamp and you've got it here very similar to this 1073 just a bit more bite a little more aggression i think if you ask me so let's crank it and see what this sounds like so here's the sound of the 1084 completely maxed out and overloading and this is what it sounds like what do you guys think of the neve 1084 fully maxed out so you can hear what it does all right moving on to the next one Okay, so now you're hearing the sound of the SSL, the 4000E channel strip. And once again, it's a channel strip, so it's got a compressor, and it's got an expander and gate, and it's got EQs over here. It's all the things that you'd need. You can already hear it saturating. I'm actually pushing it harder than I should have. Um, let me try to change that. So it's just a little bit less saturation, but you can really hear what it does. You, you can, like, listen to that. You can hear what it does. All right, let's max it out. Okay, so we're overloading on the SSL right now. So that's the sound of the SSL with the overload here. Ooh. Overloading, so you can hear what it does at the maximum level. And that's the sound of it. All right, moving on. Okay, so now you're hearing the sound of the Universal Audio 610B. I can hear it saturating already. This is what the Beach Boys uh, used to record a lot of people. And I think Adele's last album i'm not sure or the album before that anyway uh this comes uh when you buy an apollo it comes free so you don't have to buy this one uh at least it was for me and i think it still is so this is a sound of the 610b tube preamp so let's max it out so that's the sound of the maxed out you can hear that overload you can actually hear the compression it kind of compresses as i get louder it kind of compresses a bit that's really interesting like a tube would. Ah, I love that. That's really good. All right, so this is a sound of the 610B by Universal Audio, and it is maxed out. Moving on to, I think, the very last one. Okay, so now I'm on the V76. This is an old tube preamp, an old German tube preamp. Um, this was made famous, well, it's been, it's been on so many albums, but you will really recognize the sound. The guitar in Revolution by the Beatles, uh, that very beginning um, is going through a uh, V76. The cool thing about the V76 that I want to say is that it has 75 gain, uh, de decibels of gain. 75 decibels of gain. So 
when you swap out these preamps in unison, you are essentially changing the actual physical preamp in a way. You're virtually <laughs> physically changing the preamp. So when I say this preamp has 75 uh, decibels of gain, but that preamp only has 50 and that preamp has 60, it really is modeling that. I'm actually getting way more gain out of the Apollo preamp when I use a V76. It's insane. It actually changes the gain structure. It changes everything. So, you know, you're not just throwing a plug-in in. You're, you're really changing the, the receiver of the mic. Uh, you know, it, it's just incredible. All right, let's max it out. Okay, so now you're hearing the sound of the V76 uh, maxed out. I had to bring the output way down because it, it just, oh, it, my headphones were making it feedback. Um, so here's that 75 decibels of gain cranked right up, and you can see we're pinning the needle right, right, right there. We're just totally pinning it, and this is the sound of it. Okay, so that's the end of the preamps. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. To see the poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, then is heard no more. Tis a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. You can purchase your very own Universal Audio Apollo Twin X Duo for about $1,200 US. Yeah, expensive. But... There are often sales happening. In fact, as I record this video, B&H is currently selling it for 973 US dollars. And now it's time for analysis. Okay, so I'll admit that when I got the Apollo Twin X, I was probably under the spell of product placement magic, as I know this to be true of myself. I've seen it in so many videos and in so many studios that I knew I just had to have it without even realizing the power that it could wield. It had to sound good, right? I mean, why would so many professionals use these interfaces? Well, the more I played with this interface, the more I became enamored with its capabilities. I mean, how good can a preamp emulation be? Well, as it turns out, very good. Actually, in my opinion, the best. The very best preamp emulations in the world. I can't even believe how good these sound. They sound so good that I want to crap my pants. They really spared no expense creating them, and they want you to spare no expense attaining them. They're a lot. When there aren't any good sales going on, some of these preamp emulations alone, never mind the other plugins, are upwards of 300 or so US dollars, sometimes more. But it's best to wait for the sales, and they do happen. After two years, I was able to systematically collect all the preamps except for the standalone ones because they're stripped down versions of the channel strip ones, which I already own all of. They also have an awesome marketing strategy that gives you $25 towards your next plug-in purchase with a time limit of a month. So it encourages you to buy another and then another and then another. It's smart. So make sure to buy one plugin at a time so you can take advantage of getting those $25 dollar vouchers every time you buy something. But here's the deal. You're buying the Apollo to get you into the UAD ecosystem. That's your dongle, basically. You can't get most of these plugins unless you have the hardware. And you will never find preamp emulations as good as UAD ones. There are so many out there but UAD did it right, and they know it. Sure, you can load up an instance of uh, Plugin Alliance Brainworks SSL on a recorded track, and it sounds good. But the idea that you can load an instance of UAD SSL that physically takes over, remodels, and changes the physical impedance right on your interface, it's the closest thing to owning these vintage preamps and channel strips. And the best part is you don't need to maintain them. Like, changing out tubes or having them serviced at a cost of thousands. You can get a taste of the quality of UAD plugins without the hardware with their new Spark subscription model. It's got, uh, I think, 14 plugins and five instruments right now, and they're steadily adding new UAD ones to that subscription. They're really the best emulation plugins you can get, as far as I'm concerned, if you ask me. But the Shark chips that process the plugins inside the Apollo are an aging technology, and some plugins take just way too much DSP to run, like um, 
capital chambers. To combat this, you can buy satellites that add four or six or more processor chips to your ecosystem so that you can load more plugins inside. This is insanely costly, and most hobbyists or home studio owners would not be able to afford them. I can't afford them, and as such, I've kept my plugin purchases to only the ones I can use while tracking on the way in, like live in real time, or that are so freaking good that I just had to have them for mixing. The plugins are insane, and your productions will benefit from them surely. But can you make great productions without them? Of course you can. You don't need this. It's just so very nice to have and so much fun to use. I've had no hardware issues since I got this two years ago. Like not a single blip, nothing has ever failed. It has worked beautifully for me since the beginning. Luna is out of this world. That can be an entire other video. Luna is Universal Audio's free DAW, but it's more like an analog DAW. It's like working on a real console, complete with analog summing and built-in tape and consoles, all without using your Apollo's DSP. But once again, you need that expensive dongle that is an Apollo or a Solo or the like to get access to it. Also, it's Mac only for now. I'll do a video on Luna at some point in the future. It's got a bit to go to be perfect, but it's almost there. Which brings me to another downside. If you're not on a Mac, you might bring it back to the store. There are all kinds of issues when you're not on a Mac. So as it stands right now at the time of this video, Apollos are more made for Mac users. That's not to say that it can't work on a PC, but it comes with issues that I've heard. Some users have no problems while others do. For me, it makes no difference because I'm a Mac user, but be warned if you're not. Luna is also Mac exclusive at the time of this video, but they are working, I'm hearing, on a PC version. So to close this incredibly long talky talky video, I fully recommend the Universal Audio Apollo Twin X Duo if you're a music recording engineer or producer or artist, or if you're a voiceover talent or even a podcaster or a broadcaster, but not so much a field recordist or other kinds of recordists. Will it make you instantly better if you have an Apollo? No. But it sure will take you to the next level and give you a polish that only a dozen years ago, audio guys could only dream of to have at home. Brian May of Queen was totally blown away when I showed him this tech from the future when we were recording We Are the Champions back in 77. <laughs> man, that was a lot of fun, man. Ugh, I, I, I could go into that, but I'm not. I gotta, I gotta keep this going. So two things are true. One is the older one gets, the more Pringles chips suck. And the other is that Apollo Twin X Duo is a fine piece of equipment. Yes, it's expensive, but for me, totally worth it. So I hope this video helped you decide if the Apollo is right for you. But don't let me or anyone else tell you what you should or should not do. That's not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Bye now. End transmission. Holy crap, this may be the longest video I've ever done. The longest friggin' video I've ever done. It was all, that was a lot, that was a lot of information. That was a, that was an insane amount of, it was a complete amount of information. Bye now. <laughs>